following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. For today, I wanted to do something a little bit unusual, which is to read from a text and make a few little comments about the text. Normally when we give a lecture, we pick a particular topic and explain that topic or discuss it at some length. But given the context of this retreat, uh, there's a particular text that's very powerful that I thought this would be a good opportunity to introduce it to you. It's the sort of thing that you'll be able to study throughout your life. It's, it's so profound. Um, being an ordinary person, my own insight into it will be very limited. The text comes from Tibetan Buddhism, at least the, the version that I'm going to read you. But its actual age is unknown. It's very ancient. The text is most known as being one of the scriptures included in what Westerners call the Book of the Dead. That's not the actual name of the scripture. It's much older than that particular title. And that text is most known in association with Padmasambhava, whose story we heard a brief portion of last night. This particular scripture comes from India and was brought into Tibet by Padmasambhava many, many years ago and translated from Sanskrit into Tibetan. And then it was hidden, hidden from the Tibetans for a long time because of the potent nature of the text and because he knew that people were not ready. After a, many centuries passed, one man was given a vision and saw in his vision where this text had been buried in the mountains. So following the symbols of his vision, he went out into the mountains and found this text buried under some rocks. And that's how it was revealed. And since that time, it's become a staple of all the Tibetan schools. Generally, this text is read aloud, and monks will sit and listen in a state of meditation. And then they'll meditate in silence for a period of time. And then the text is read again, and then they'll meditate again. And the cycle repeats and goes on. The reason for that is that the text points directly at the nature of mind. And it's only in a state of meditation, free of the ego, that we can really comprehend the nature of this teaching. So it's a good idea for all of us to begin to focus our minds, to relax, and bring about that meditative concentration so we can do our best to receive this knowledge in as pure a way as we can. I'll warn you that the concepts that are discussed here are very challenging. You may find that your mind re reacts, it responds. 
sometimes with wonder, sometimes with doubt, sometimes with indifference. And it's these reactions of your own mind that are very important for you to notice. It's those places where your mind has obstacles, has resistance, where you need to learn something. And this is part of the value of the text and part of the reason why it's read to monks and nuns. But as a short preamble, it's useful for us to uh, put this text in context with Gnosis. In this particular retreat, we've had uh, some discussion of Tibetan Buddhism, and there's a certain presence of that teaching also in the store and in the flavor of some of the lectures. And this is because Tibetan Buddhism has particular uh, forms of wisdom and particular keys which can be very useful for all of us. But it's not to say that Gnosis is Tibetan Buddhism. It is not. Gnosis is much older. Tibetan Buddhism is a very beautiful form of Gnosis. In the same way that Zen or the Aztec mysticism or Christianity are all beautiful forms of Gnosis, different forms. So when we study texts such as this one, or we study masters such as Padmasambhava or the Buddha, we're studying them in the same way that we study Quetzalcoatl, or we study Muhammad, or we study Jesus. And it's important to make that distinction. There are many things in Gnosis that are not in Tibetan Buddhism. And there are many things in Tibetan Buddhism that are not in Gnosis. What we try to do as students is to strip away everything that's superfluous, everything that's extra, to get to the heart, to get to the real meaning, the real content. Those who've been in Gnosis for some time can attest to the difference between the way Gnosis is taught in the books of Samael and Vior and the way it's taught in the schools. And this is because each instructor and each school has their own level of understanding and their own means of teaching. And they're all different. The same is true of other religions and other movements. This is why we have to always seek to go to the source, to clarify our own understanding, to make sure that when we are studying the teaching and studying the knowledge, that we are aware of what is original and what is added. So by reading this text, I'm not suggesting that we should add it to Gnosis or that somehow Gnosis should be like Tibetan Buddhism. Reading this text is to find what is useful in any religion, in any teaching. In English, this text is called the Introduction to Awareness. The longer title is Natural Liberation Through Naked Perception. And it's excerpted from a longer series which is called Peaceful and Wrathful Deities, a profound sacred teaching entitled Natural Liberation Through Recognition of Enlightened Intention. I'm not going to read you the entire text the way it would normally be read. Because I think to do that, we would actually have to be in meditation and in a state where we can receive it in context. So what I'll do is I'll read portions, and then we'll discuss those portions. The first thing that I'll read is a section called The Importance of the Introduction to Awareness. And so open your mind. Let go of your preconceptions and listen closely. Though the single nature of mind, which completely pervades both cyclic existence and nirvana, has been naturally present from the beginning, you have not recognized it. Even though its radiance and awareness have never been interrupted, you have not yet encountered its true face. Even though it arises unimpededly in every facet of existence, you have not as yet recognized this single nature of mind. In order that this single nature might be recognized by you, the conquerors of the three times, 
have taught an inconceivably vast number of practices, including the 84,000 aspects of the sacred teachings. Yet, despite this diversity, not even one of these teachings has been given by the conquerors outside the context of an understanding of this nature. And even though there are inestimable volumes of sacred writings, equally vast as the limits of space, actually, these teachings can be succinctly expressed in a few words, which are the introduction to awareness. Often in Gnosis, the instructors and the books repeatedly emphasize the importance of developing moment-to-moment -moment concentration and awareness. This passage is stating the same thing. The sacred teachings have innumerable forms, which is clearly visible to all of us who study Gnosis. The myriad diversity of the teachings of wisdom that have been received by humanity. But all of them can be expressed in one thing, which is to awaken now, in this moment, to be awake, to pay attention, to not be distracted. And in that is the door to all of those myriads of teachings. And without that understanding of awareness, all of those teachings will forever remain obscure. That's how important developing moment-to-moment -moment attentiveness truly is. O oh, fortunate children, listen to these words. The term mind is commonplace and widely used. Yet there are those who do not understand its meaning. Those who falsely understand it, those who partially understand it, and those who have not quite understood its genuine reality. Thus, there has arisen an inconceivably vast number of assertions as to the nature of mind, posited by the various philosophical systems. Further, since ordinary persons do not understand the meaning of the term mind and do not intuitively recognize its nature, they continue to roam through the six classes of sentient rebirth within the three world systems and consequently experience suffering. This is the fault of not understanding this intrinsic nature of mind. As students of a teaching like this, we're presented with many different ways of understanding our own consciousness. You can see this in just the few days we've had at this retreat. We've been presented with a variety of practices and a variety of terms, all of which have certain usefulness and certain abilities that we can take advantage of. Yet, if we don't clearly understand what the consciousness is, then these practices can be very confusing. In fact, sometimes they can seem useless. We won't see the point of them, the usefulness of them. So once again, we have to return to that original point. What is the nature of mind? Not the, another person's mind, but our own. When we, in this moment, look into our own mind, what is the nature of that? What is the nature of our experience from moment to moment? How do we interrelate with everything that we perceive? What is functioning there? What are the dynamics? This is the understanding that we need. It's not sufficient to memorize complicated theories nor is it sufficient to become an expert in various philosophies. The great importance is for us as individuals to discover our own nature. 
And we are the only ones who can do it. And the only way we can is now. In each activity, in each moment, regardless of what's happening outside or inside, we need to maintain consistent mindfulness, consistent awareness, persistent endeavor to always maintain that watchful point of view, whether things are peaceful or agitated. In doing so, we are confronted with many different phenomena that can be somewhat bewildering. Meditation is the critical practice within which we put ourselves in a state of calm in order to have an active consciousness which can actively perceive the true nature of the mind. Now, there's the passivity of the body, and there's the passivity of thought, and the passivity of emotion, and the passivity of sensation, within the midst of which must be the activity of awareness. And that state can only arise through our own cultivation of it. Part of what this text presents to us is that that state of ever-present watchfulness is eternal. Yet we don't recognize it. We forget. We become distracted. More than likely, even in the context of this brief discussion, we may find that the mind takes us off to some other place to think about some other thing. And then we come back and realize we've lost the thread, the continuity of the talk. And this demonstrates the challenge that we have, the difficulty that we have to deal with our own mind. It takes tremendous vigilance, but we must be unrelenting in order to comprehend the nature of our own experience. In the state of meditation, actual meditation, not mere concentration, the goal or the the purpose is to present ourselves with the true nature of our experience. So long as our mind is distracted and bouncing between all the different surging elements that arise from moment to moment, we cannot maintain a consistent perceptive point of view that can penetrate into the true nature of any given thing. So we do all the concentration practices and all the other activities to cultivate that state of rest so that within that place we can then turn back and look into the mind itself, look into the consciousness itself. Some of us may have tasted this or experienced it to some degree. The text that I'm going to read next is related to that experience to that experience of having enough stability to actually perceive how thoughts arise, how they're sustained, and how they are dispersed, or how they dissolve. So reflect and look into yourself now and observe how every given element, whether it's from inside or outside, has this process of arising and passing. And look to that as I read this section. This is called the three considerations. The following is the introduction to the means of experiencing this single nature of mind. Through the application of three considerations. First, recognize that past thoughts are traceless, clear, and empty. Second, recognize that future thoughts are unproduced and fresh. And third, recognize that the present moment abides naturally and unconstructed. When this ordinary, momentary consciousness is examined 
nakedly and directly by oneself. Upon examination, it is a radiant awareness, which is free from the presence of an observer, manifestly stark and clear, completely empty and uncreated in all respects, lucid, without duality of radiance and emptiness, not permanent, for it is lacking inherent existence in all respects, not a mere nothingness, for it is radiant and clear, not a single entity, for it is clearly perceptible as a multiplicity, yet not existing inherently as a multiplicity, for it is indivisible and of a single savor. This intrinsic awareness, which is not extraneously derived, is itself the genuine introduction to the abiding nature of all things. For in this intrinsic awareness, the three Buddha bodies are inseparable and fully present as one. When we become distracted, engaged in the random nature of thought, or carried along by that flowing torrent of emotion, which changes in quality from moment to moment, from calm and cool, to passion, to doubt, to fear. These torrents prevent us from perceiving the luminous and clear, unobstructed nature of our own Buddha essence, our own consciousness. This is why we study meditation. The practice of meditation is where we sit calmly, we close our eyes to all external sight, we close our attention to any given phenomena outside of the object we're directing our attention towards. And in that way, we focus our attention, we focus our awareness. The ultimate point of this is to be able to see the nature of that awareness itself, to see the nature of that mind in itself as it exists without any artifice, without any bottle, without any filter. But to arrive at this experience can only be produced, can only occur when we are willing to give up, to renounce, to walk away from all the things that distract us all the rest of the time. And here's the problem. We don't want to. By some strange magic, we love to be distracted. By some strange phenomenon, we enjoy it when we suffer. Otherwise, if we did not truly enjoy it, why would we keep it? If we were truly tired of suffering from our anger, why would we become angry? Why could we not just recognize that anger as suffering and refuse to accommodate it? And yet, when anger arises, we do accommodate it. In fact, we welcome it. We feed it. We stimulate it. We nourish it. We keep it alive. Within each of our minds are elements of memory, events that have occurred to us in the past that we will not let go. Something someone said, something that someone did, that we keep alive in our mind. When it arises in our memory and our thoughts, we sustain it. We think to ourselves, oh yeah, what that guy said to me was wrong. He was not doing something good. He treated me badly. And thus we invest more energy into that memory and into that thought, into that feeling. And that becomes a filter which prevents us from seeing what actually happened and what is actually happening. So this is a self-perpetuated cycle. The beginning of it is in the moment that that original event occurred. 
when the impressions of a given situation struck at our senses and produced a vibration which resounded within our entire psyche. Something someone said or someone did which offended us, which hurt our feelings, which made us feel that we were not being respected or not being valued or not being understood. In that instant, we ourselves created a formation in our mind whose construction was designed by ourselves and whose purpose is to sustain the mistaken perception of reality. This is a very important facet. We do not perceive reality because we choose not to see it. We do not comprehend the nature of mind because we do not want to. Anger is a desire. It is not only a desire to inflict revenge, to get back at someone, it is also a desire to sustain that mistaken sense of self to keep it alive, to perpetuate our own sense of what happened or what is happening. And this is the single cause of the state of this world. That simple transformation that happens in a moment and then is perpetuated in the psyche of each person. Of course, this happens not only with anger, it happens with pride, it happens with fear, it happens with gluttony, with greed, with envy, with jealousy. With such a multiplicity of psychological elements that the mind, the sense of self, becomes this very sophisticated and complex structure and we become deeply confused. This is why in Gnosis and in other traditions the emphasis is placed so strongly on paying attention. This is not merely a a superficial exercise. It is not merely something interesting. It is completely essential. As you remember in the text, the writer states that all of the beings that exist who are circulating throughout all the worlds who suffer, suffer simply because they do not understand the nature of mind. Or in Gnostic terms, the nature of consciousness. All suffering. Every creature who suffers, suffers for that cause. This is a very deep, deep thing to comprehend in yourself. In each moment, there are transformations happening. Regardless of the circumstances, whether you're in a peaceful place, such as this, or in a chaotic place, such as a big city, your psyche is receiving and transforming energy. But what makes the difference is how you maintain awareness of it. If we continue living the way we have been, then we will continue creating problems for ourselves and other people. The moment-to-moment effort to concentrate ourselves and maintain awareness of our own perception is the fundamental basis of any spiritual practice, no matter what you call it. And this is partly why, in the Gnostic tradition, you will meet and encounter students who've come from every possible walk of life, every possible profession, every possible religion, because the essential nature of this teaching is universal. 
This science is studied by all levels of beings, not merely in this physical world, but in other worlds, because its knowledge and its potency is so profound. There's a story related to the Master Samael. While giving a lecture, he began to go into some topic that no one in the audience could comprehend. And then he stopped and apologized and said that he was addressing the gods who were attending the lecture. This emphasizes for us the nature of the teaching. That even if we've been in the teaching or been in the studying this kind of material for a long time, we're not done. We're only done when suffering has been eradicated. When our own ego is no longer there. Then we're done. Until that time, we are all of us equals, brothers and sisters, friends. Friends in the house of Aquarius. We're all ordinary people. Fortunately, we can help each other by meeting in a context like this. We can discuss these teachings and try to arrive at a, a mutual understanding. But the best thing that we can do is to apply the science from moment to moment, to meditate, to look inside of our own experience in each moment. The next portion of the text reads in this way. When the introduction is powerfully applied in accordance with the above method for entering into this reality, one's own immediate consciousness is this very reality. Abiding in this reality, which is uncontrived and naturally radiant, how can one say that one does not understand the nature of mind. Abiding in this reality, wherein there is nothing on which to meditate, how can one say that by having entered into meditation, one was not successful? Abiding in this reality, which is one's own actual awareness itself, how can one say that one could not find one's own mind? Abiding in this reality, the uninterrupted union of radiance and awareness, how can one say that the true face of mind has not been seen? Abiding in this reality, which is itself the cognizer, how can one say that though sought, this cognizer could not be found? Abiding in this reality, where there is nothing at all to be done, how can one say that whatever one did, one did not succeed. Given that it is sufficient to leave this awareness as it is, uncontrived, how can one say that one could not continue to abide in that state? Given that it is sufficient to leave it as it is, without doing anything whatsoever, how can one say that one could not do just that? Given that, Within this reality, radiance, awareness, and emptiness are inseparable and spontaneously present. How can one say that by having practiced, one attained nothing? Given that this reality is naturally originating and spontaneously present without causes or conditions, how can one say that by having made the effort to find it, one was incapable of success? Given that the arising and liberation of conceptual thoughts occur simultaneously, how can one say that by having applied this antidote to conceptual thoughts, one was not effective? Abiding in this immediate consciousness itself, how can one say that one does not know this reality? When we say that we do not know how to meditate, that we're not having success in meditation, or that we do not understand meditation. The fault lies not in the system. The fault does not lie in the school, or the instructor, or the book. 
The fault lies in our own mistaken perception. Every existing sentient creature has within itself an uncontrived, naturally present awareness. And it is the simple and pure activity of that conscious, present awareness which is in itself the state of meditation. It becomes contrived when it becomes trapped in the thought. It becomes contrived when it becomes trapped in emotion or sensation. But when the consciousness, when the awareness is in itself natural, free, unfiltered, and unmodified, it is in itself the state of meditation. So it's actually quite simple. Meditation itself is the simplest thing there is because it is simply the state of being. The state of existence in its natural state. This is the state of dhyana, which is a state in which there is no I. There is only awareness. This text stated that there is not even an observer. There is simply awareness. And the understanding of that is something that you will have to experience. It cannot be explained. It has to be understood. When we're receiving lectures and talks and studying books about how to maintain continual observance of ourselves or how to concentrate and comprehend any given psychological element, really it all comes down to the same simple thing be. Don't think. Don't become distracted. Be pure awareness, because that is your true nature. That is the true nature of every existing thing. Unfortunately, we have forgotten that. And we have built a very elaborate castle within which we hide and have become trapped due to habituation. And that castle has our given name. It has all the attributes through karma. But our awareness itself does not have that name. Our root awareness does not suffer from doubt. It does not suffer from shame. It does not suffer from resentment or envy. Our root awareness, our profound, pristine nature of mind is just that. Simple, uncontrived love. Pure. You can access that any moment. You don't have to come to a place like this to access your true nature of mind. Neither do you have to have a big library or live in a particular place or have a particular body shape or hair color or be male or female. Every existing thing can access and utilize this root awareness. And most existing creatures, such as these birds, the trees, the grass, even the water, exist in and, themse in and of themselves as they are. They're not contrived. They do not presume anything. They are not pretentious. They simply are what they are. The goal and purpose of our studies is to become that. To stop lying to ourselves. To be what we are. To let go of all of the false notions that we have. But now. The work on the ego does not begin in the future. 
It does not begin when we meditate. It doesn't begin when we've read a certain book. It begins instant. We remember we are not that. In the instant when that situation of anger repeats and someone criticizes us or makes us look embarrassed, we become ashamed. In that instant, we separate the awareness, our true nature, from that discursive emotion. And we recognize that emotion for what it is, a contrivance, a falsehood, a lie, an illusion. That separation begins comprehension. Comprehension begins the instant we are in that natural state. The instant we are ourselves. We are authentic. We are genuine, real, no contrivance, nothing false. This is where comprehension begins. When we study the ego, oftentimes our attention is focused on things like anger, lust, envy. And we seek those elements. And some students become almost obsessed with identifying and discovering these sort of negative psychological manifestations. But it's necessary for us to mature beyond that. Our true nature, our true identity, is neither good nor evil. Our true nature simply is. It simply is. Any form of duality is below the true nature of mind. And this becomes very tricky for our intellect to understand. It's easy to become distracted by all the different concepts of mind, the, the philosophies, the theories, duality versus non-duality, absolute versus non-absolute, conceptual versus non-conceptual. But the experience tells all. The actual experience of the nature of mind will clarify all of those apparent contradictions. This is why when you study someone like Samael Anvior or someone like Padmasambhava, you find that their teaching goes well beyond mere duality. It goes well beyond mere labeling of psychological elements. They may use labels from time to time to communicate to us, but the actual experience of the mind is far beyond any label. In a state of meditation, when that naked perception is active and free and perceives in its vision any given psychological error, whether it's an error that looks good or looks bad, the true nature of that error becomes apparent. It becomes clear. It becomes what it is, an illusion, a dewdrop, a mirage, a bubble, a cloud. This is what we can see in the great serenity of the Buddha's face. In the great vast mind that expresses these kinds of wisdom where we can't really find an eye, neither good nor bad. There is just a wisdom, something inexpressible, something indescribable. 
that is what is in the heart of our own experience. And that is something we can taste and experience if we make the effort. The next section is called Observations Related to Examining the Nature of Mind. So once again, relax yourself. Don't think. Just become awareness. Just listen. Try to digest this without comparing. Be certain that the nature of mind is empty and without foundation. One's own mind is insubstantial, like an empty sky. Look at your own mind to see whether it is like that or not. What happens between thoughts? What is there? Look into yourself and look for that place. What is there between thoughts? What is there between emotions? What is there between sensations? Nothing. And yet something. That is the nature of your mind. Simple, pure, uncontrived. Awareness. Divorced from views which constructedly determine the nature of emptiness, be certain that pristine cognition, naturally originating, is primordially radiant, just like the nucleus of the sun, which is itself naturally originating. Look at your own mind to see whether it is like that or not. Be certain that this awareness, which is pristine cognition, is uninterrupted, like the coursing central torrent of a river which flows unceasingly. Look at your own mind to see whether it is like that or not. Be certain that conceptual thoughts and fleeting memories are not strictly identifiable, but insubstantial in their motion like the breezes of the atmosphere. Look at your own mind to see whether it is like that or not. Be certain that all that appears is naturally manifest in the mind, like the images in a mirror, which also appear naturally. Look at your own mind to see whether it is like that or not. Be certain that all characteristics are liberated right where they are, like the clouds of the atmosphere, naturally originating and naturally dissolving. Look at your own mind to see whether it is like that or not. The Master Samael and Vior stated in the book Revolution of the Dialectic that if we stop thinking on a problem, the problem goes away. This is cause for some debate, but it is a fact. Our problems persist because we don't let go of them. Our conflicts persist because we grasp them as if they are real. And believe it or not, the same is true of pain. The same is true of most forms of suffering. If we have the capacity to not identify, 
to be serene, to just be the consciousness, then you can perceive that your thoughts arise, persist for a moment, and then naturally dissolve. But to see that, you have to not be identified. You have to be aware. If you're identified with a thought, then there appears to be a continual stream of thinking because you continue to be identified from one thought to another thought and then to another associated thought and then to some other thought. Continual. This is what we call chatter. This is what we call a psychological song. This is what we mistakenly call ourselves. But it's not. It is simply a regurgitation of elements that are foreign to our true nature. Of elements that we ourselves built and hold on to. And persist to produce suffering because we ourselves originate it. The ego is not a creation of God. Our suffering is not a creation of God. It is a creation of our own hands. And we perpetuate it with our own hands, with our own action. Learning to separate your awareness, to not become identified with any sensation, with any emotion, with any thought, is your own direct introduction to the true nature of mind, which is simply a state of being. That state of being has many levels. It is not the same for everyone. Our state of being is relative to our developed degree of consciousness, which right now is about 3%, which is very small. The rest of our true nature is trapped. But even that trapped nature is as yet undeveloped. Even as we begin to free it, it still needs development. That root nature in us is simply the Buddha nature. It is the potentiality to become a Buddha. It is not a Buddha. When we develop that nature of mind, when that nature of mind acquires cognizance of itself, then a Buddha is born. When the text says that the nature of mind is empty, any one of us can verify that to our own level. When we look to see what's there between thoughts. What is there? In those instants, however brief, when a thought does not arise. That is precisely the experience that we need to become very familiar with. That is self-observation. That is self-remembering. Simple, pure, directed attention. Uncontrived. Beautiful. And by understanding that, we can grasp what Samael M. Vior said when he said, if we stop thinking on a problem, it goes away. When you're in the face of some difficulty, and you become identified, you make the problem worse. Whatever the problem is, whether it's a simple one or a complex one. Identification has many forms, equivalent to the many forms of the ego. But as a simple example, we can say that if you see that your mind is obsessively thinking about something, you're identified. If you can see that your emotions are consistently churned up, then you are identified. If you are tense, you are identified. 
if you have some physical discomfort which has no apparent cause, then it's likely that you are simply identified, but uncognizant, unaware. The natural state of the mind is a state of perfect relaxation. And from that state of mind, no matter what event arises, whether it's internal or external, that nature of mind does not become identified. And thus that experience arises, sustains itself, and passes away. The mind itself remains serene. In that way you can see that the mind itself is empty. You can see that it has no inherent nature, and yet it has inherent ex existence. So it appears contradictory. Nonetheless, it is a state of equanimity, a state of natural serenity, which can never be contrived, which can never be faked. It can only arise of its own nature when there is no contrivance, no falsity, no pretension. Now we're going to go a little bit deeper, briefly, and here's where we're going to start to see a little more contradiction. So you have to be very attentive. There are no phenomena extraneous to those that originate from the mind. So how could there be anything on which to meditate apart from the mind? There are no phenomena extraneous to those that originate from the mind. So there are no modes of conduct to be undertaken extraneous to those that originate from the mind. There are no phenomena extraneous to those that originate from the mind. So there are no commitments to be kept extraneous to those that originate from the mind. There are no phenomena extraneous to those that originate from the mind. So there are no results to be attained extraneous to those that originate from the mind. There are no phenomena extraneous to those that originate from the mind. So one should observe one's mind looking into its nature again and again. If Upon looking outwards towards the external expanse of the sky, there are no projections emanated by the mind. And if, on looking inwards at one's own mind, there is no projectionist who projects thoughts by thinking them, then one's own mind, completely free from conceptual projections, will be luminously clear. That is meditation. No projectionist. No illusion. Maya, which is a term we've all heard, is a word that's often used to express the idea that phenomena or nature is illusion. But there's something very deep that must be understood about Maya. It is self-produced. No one imposed ignorance upon us outside of ourselves. What this text is saying is that everything that arises without exception arises because of our own state of mind. Every thought, every emotion, Every sensation is self-produced. So how can we look for blame outside? How can we look for a solution outside? We cannot. The source, the cause, 
is our own mistaken perception. The solution is our own naked perception, liberated from contrivance, liberated from pride, liberated from anger and from lust, and all the other elements about which we know. Thus, the text indicates, since all things emerge from the mind and dissolve into the mind, look always into the nature of mind. That is, into the nature of your own psyche. Part of the mistake that we make is we're always looking outside. If we're single, we have the mistaken perception that we'll only be happy when we're in a couple. And those who are in couples know how much they're suffering and want to be single again. And so there's the circle. There's a cycle. Self-perpetuated, mistaken views. If you recall, one of the hallmarks of the teaching that the Buddha gave is called right view. It's actually the first one. That point of view, right view, is the understanding of the empty nature of the mind. It is not simply what we would call self-observation, if we were studying it in a very basic level. It is true self-observation, which is the active presence of the true nature of self, which is uncontrived, naked, without an eye, without any preconceived filter, without any preconceived notion, looking at everything as if it were new, looking at every phenomena as if it has never been seen before. Some of you have seen me just for a few days. Some of you have seen me for 10 years or more. Does your mind think, since you've seen me once, you've already seen me? Thus, you know what I am, you know what I look like, you know what I'm like, you know how I am. This is a lie that your own mind produces. Nothing is static. Nothing is immutable. Everything is changing. And nothing is as we assume it to be, yet we assume. The effort then becomes to let go of assumptions, to forget contrivances, to forget our self-interest, to be, to perceive, to be receptive. This natural state of mind, which is luminous and clear, is pure, unaltered, raw perception. If in this moment we fully feel that and become that, we cannot be thinking about a problem. We cannot be worried about the future. We can only be there, perceiving, receiving. You know that the word Kabbalah comes from Kabel, which means to receive. That reception is not just in the intellect, in studying books and studying lectures. It's not just in the heart, believing or not believing. It's not just in the motor brain, acting like a Kabbalist. It is in being a perceiver perceiving each individual instant in its unaltered form. And it's from that place that the doors of clairvoyance and intuition will open. And it's from that place that true kabel can occur. You see, when we're contrived, when we're carrying around our mask, the false personality, and we're encapsulated in that shell of our sense of self, the true nature of reality cannot be seen because we refuse to see it. 
think on that. We're all attracted to this teaching because we sense there is something beyond the physical senses. Unanimously, we agree there is something more than just what people say and what people believe. We have all had some experience which tells us there is a reality beyond this simple physical matter. And then comes the moment when we realize we can't see it. We can't access it. We're trying to meditate and we cannot. We're trying to get out of the body and we cannot. We're trying to understand what does God want from me? And we don't understand. And so we go here and there and everywhere, asking for advice, reading different books, finding new websites, studying new theories, new philosophies, adopting new practices. All the while, the problem is inside. The problem is that we do not look with unfiltered vision. This is a beautiful aspect of the Zen teaching. Zen philosophy and Zen art clearly express the need. Also in Taoism, to just be, to be oneself, to be what one is, to observe, to experience things as they are. To not be seeking in books, schools, and lectures and philosophies, but to be seeking now. Look at this beautiful place. Can you perceive the nature of this moment free of any artifice? I would tell you that you can, but only if you will it. Only if you're willing to let go of all those residual emotions which are grasping at you and which you in turn grasp at. Different desires, different emotions, different longings, cravings, memories, worries about the future, hopes for the future. All of those things prevent you from seeing what is. The longing to experience Gnosis is beneficial. It's what drives us, it inspires us. But it can become a problem when we become identified with it. When that craving to experience samadhi or to get out of the body becomes so strong, we stop seeing reality. The fact is, any one of us can enter the state of dhyana today. There's nothing preventing you from experiencing samadhi except your own perception. There's nothing preventing you from getting out of the body except for your own perception. Because each one of us becomes identified from moment to moment with this or that. Thus the text repeats and repeats and repeats. Look to the nature of your own mind. Look to the nature of your own mind. Free yourself of artifice. Notice and observe how things arise and pass. Do not become identified. Do not become distracted. Be what you are. That state of being is a state of such equanimity. There's perfect acceptance of whatever is there without any resistance, without any desire. There's no craving for something else. There's no aversion to something that is. If you're meditating, if you have aversion to the pain that you feel, then you are blocked. If you're meditating and you have craving for samadhi, you are blocked. If you're trying to get out of your body and you have fear, you're blocked. And each of these elements is self-originated. 
self-produced, contrived by yourself. This is the nature of self-observation and self-remembering. And it is the basis of every single practice that we study in Gnosis. It is the basis of the entire doctrine. It is truly the basis of every religion. To learn to be. And yet, to not be what we are. Do you understand that? To be, but to not be. I'm flipping it. To be, but to be not. If we remain as we are, our suffering will remain as it is. But if we become what we really are, our suffering will stop. When we cease to be identified with a problem, it goes away. If you're having money troubles, and you're worried, and you're afraid, and you feel you have to do something, and it agitates you, stop thinking about it. Do what you can do today. And if you can't do something today, stop thinking about it. There's a beautiful secret there, which the Master Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount. And we can see that here. If we observe nature, there's no worry here. Which of these creatures around us are concerned, worried, anxious, afraid? None. Neither the flies, nor the birds, nor the trees, nor the wind, all of which have consciousness, all of which form a part of this beautiful creation. None of them are worried. None of them have any fear or concern for tomorrow. They are simply being what they are. It's in this way that we can resolve our most vexing problems. What happens is this. If you're a serious student of these types of studies, really what you're trying to do is to be a serious disciple of your own inner master. That part of your consciousness which gave you life and has a work for you to do. Your being needs you. It might sound sacrilegious, but it's true. Our own inner father, our own divine mother, need us. And thus will give us what they need us to have. And we forget that. Because we forget them. When we're in that state of natural being, the state of natural perception, Self-remembering arises naturally as well. When we're in that state of self-remembering, we are truly a child of God. Filial love arises spontaneously because that is the nature of the consciousness. If we are truly aware, if we are truly in our unaltered natural state, So because of that, why should we worry? If the one who's inside of us, our own inner master, needs us, and he's God, what do we have to worry about? What do we need outside of ourselves, outside of him, outside of her, outside of that which truly is? Why are we always running here and there? grasping on to different experiences, different sensations. It's not to say that we should just sit and not do anything. It's to say we should do what we have to do naturally. 
We have to work. We have to fulfill our duties in life. But we don't have to do it with anxiety, with fear, with worries, with pride. We can be what we are, a simple essence, a Buddha nature that wants to grow, that wants to grow and develop itself, to perfect itself. Our own inner being will give us everything we could possibly need to accomplish that task because that is what he needs from us. The reason we don't have what we need is that we get in the way. We don't know how to be natural. To be naked as a consciousness. Instead, we want to dress ourselves with these vestures of pride, of envy, of gluttony, of vanity. We want others to see us as that to respect us, to admire us, to envy us. We are not who we truly are. And because of that, we suffer. And because of that, we don't have the things that we truly need. When we become very disciplined in being just consciousness, magically, what we need appears, as if by magic. Because the being gives us that naturally. You've all heard stories like this of how such and such a master was without food, without money, without water, without anything, and yet was able to sustain himself because the, f the beasts of the field would bring him sustenance or the fairies or elementals would bring water or bring clothes. There are many stories like that. They're there to illustrate for us something simple. If we serve the one who's inside, he provides. Then we can just be ourselves. We can live without any worry. The natural state of the consciousness is a state of pure, raw acceptance. And yet, that state of acceptance is driven by an energy to become better. This seems a little contradictory, but we all know something of it because we're studying this knowledge. We all know that we can do better. We can be better. And so we want to change. all that so long as we are what we are we cannot be what we need to be what we should be so let us first not be what we are so we can become what we really are do you guys have any questions maybe from studying this text you can see that Meditation does not begin when the bell rings. It doesn't begin in the evening or in the morning when you sit on a cushion or a chair to meditate. This is why in some traditions they state that meditation never stops. Because truly it does not. When you really sincerely and seriously begin to comprehend the nature of the consciousness, then you truly and seriously begin to meditate non-stop amidst everything. In the books of Samael and Vior, there are, um, there's, for example, a chapter called The Observer and the Observed. And this is one of the fundamental things that we learn when we study self-observation. The, the purpose of that exercise is to develop the capacity to divide the attention. To develop the capacity to activate the consciousness and to separate it. To become aware of it. This text states that there is no observer. 
The reason is because while there appears to be an observer, in reality, that observer has no eye. And so thus does not exist as an observer, but it simply is. We do need to divide attention between observer and observed, and yet there really is no observer. But until you know how to make that division, you can't comprehend that statement. Yet we all have the capacity. It's the natural capacity of the consciousness to be attentive. And we think in our intellect that if you're attentive, there must be someone who's paying attention. And yet, when you're in a state of pure attention, can you find a self? When you look into the nature of your own mind in this moment, can you truly find a self? When you see that space between thoughts, is there a self there? Can you find something that you can call a self? Independent and existing on its own? You can't. Because each attribute is dependent on another attribute. Each facet is dependent upon another, which means without those facets, there's nothing. In other words, when you look into that observer, you simply see the act of observation, the pure energy of consciousness, which has no self. It has no concept. It has no center. It has no beginning. It has no ending. But this is something you have to taste. The intellect will fail to grasp it. It can be experienced at any moment. We've all tasted it. We've all experienced it, but we've forgotten. We begin just being naturally aware, naturally observant. Observing not only what we observe, but how we observe it. This is the division. Observing the phenomena that are arising outside and inside. Also observing how we observe that. And little by little, out of that experience of observing the outside and the inside and the way we observe, suddenly it becomes clear, where's the observer? One could be observing and perceive, where is the observer? This is particularly important when you're trying to separate and identify aspects of the ego. This kind of questioning is very useful when you're trying to separate from discursive emotion and thought. Because a discursive emotion and a discursive thought is an I. It is an eye that has specific wants, specific cravings, specific aversions, and can be seen. So, so long as we are continuing to see an eye, then we have not penetrated to that which is without an eye. So there's some contradictions that get a little tricky to navigate in the philosophy. How can you perceive an eye without an eye? How can you observe or be something without being something? And this is the limit of philosophy and the danger. And this is partly what this text was addressing in the very beginning. Although many schools have posited many theories and philosophies of the nature of mind, none have understood it. This is because it can only be understood by experience. And that's something that's up to us. 
Any questions? Yes. The question is about what happens or what one can do with the experience of the state of emptiness. So once we've accessed that and experienced the empty nature of mind, then what? Where does that lead? Where does that go? The empty nature of mind is a fundamental basis that we need to understand. And we need to understand it by experience. But that is not the whole picture. When we study this teaching, we see that this knowledge is the path of the bodhisattva. And that path is a path direct to the absolute, which is that emptiness, very profound, beyond any sense of self. When you begin to have that type of understanding of the nature of the emptiness of existence, that in itself is not sufficient. What's missing there is compassion. The nature of reality can only be fully perceived by a combination of two things. Naked perception of the emptiness of any phenomena and love. There are some schools that will teach one side or the other of the equation. Some schools teach to just cultivate pure love, while others seek to cultivate pure awareness of emptiness. Both are mistaken. They can take you to a certain point, but they cannot take you all the way. And what can is the cultivation of bodhicitta. And that's, of course, a Sanskrit word which means the enlightened mind or the awakened mind of wisdom. But bodhicitta is comprised of two fundamental aspects which cannot be separated. They are, in truth, one thing. But this intellect can never grasp it. And that is how the empty nature of existence is synonymous with love. It's hard to even philosophize about that. Because what does that mean? And yet, that is the fundamental nature of life. The absolute itself is that ray which released the, the ray of creation which manifested all things, and that ray is Christ. That ray is love, but that ray is emptiness. It is empty of self. There is no I. So the experience of emptiness, the experience of the empty nature of mind is very good. But we have to go past that. If you experience something like that, it's very difficult to maintain your equilibrium. As the Master Samael stated, when he first experienced the nature of emptiness, he was terrified. And that's the natural response of the animal mind, which doesn't belong to that. So the challenge becomes, where can you bridge the gap? How can you enter into that profound emptiness, which is no I, and which the I cannot go? You have to know what it is to be no I, to have no self. And the only thing that can give you that is Christ. Avalokiteshvara. Chinrezi. The love and emptiness that are expressed as that light, the ray of creation. We have that as a spark, latent in the atoms of our own essence. But we have to develop it. When that essence grows, when the consciousness grows, when that consciousness receives that ray of creation and enters into the bodhisattva path and be, starts to become that light, 
then the emptiness becomes more profound. It becomes enterable and sustainable. This is done from the position of dhyana, which is that fifth paramita, the fifth perfection, which is meditation. That state of perfect equanimity, perfect attentive awareness. No I, no self. And from that state, one can enter prana, the wisdom of the emptiness, the wisdom of the absence. This is the only way. So there are a lot of elements at play here. Love, compassion, the death of the self, the death of the I, initiation, a lot of work. And yet it's been done. It's been done and it will be done again. If we're serious, if we're serious to die in ourselves, to completely eradicate any sense of I, of pride, of envy, of lust, that true nature, that true consciousness, the essence, can develop and grow and become one with that emptiness, which is also love. This is the only way. Any other questions? You had one. Sure. <clears throat> it's useful when you're analyzing any form of dualism, such as vice versus virtue, or superior versus inferior, to always remember the tree of life. Everything manifests in levels. So in our own psyche, we have levels of the psyche. The consciousness is just an energy. It's a form of energy which is derived from a very superior region and that enters into a very inferior one in order to gather knowledge, to learn. And in order to do that, it has to process itself through the vehicles that we inhabit, most immediately the physical body. And within that body, we have certain transformers, which we call the three brains. And these transform the energies back and forth between this level of reality and the consciousness. So in that way you can see the consciousness is beyond all of this. So the same is true when you compare and look at superior versus inferior emotion. Of course, inferior emotion is any egoic state. Inferior intellect is likewise. It's a form of reasoning which belongs to an inferior level. Superior emotion and superior intellect also correspond to their levels, but they are not the supreme. You remember, the Master said, the most elevated form of thought is non-thought. It becomes difficult to us, for us to grasp that the consciousness itself does not think, nor does it need to. The consciousness in itself does not feel emotion in the way we know emotion, whether inferior or superior. The consciousness in itself is, and yet, in its most elevated and developed form, it has qualities that we would call emotion, but which are well beyond that. A master or an angel or a, any highly developed being expresses itself as love, descends into this planet, and assists all those who suffer. And if we observe the life of a master like that, we would look at them and say, well, they have emotions like us. But they don't. It's different. This is similar to the mistake that people make when they think that Jesus was angry at the merchants in the temple when he was whipping them. But that was not anger. It was something else far beyond our concepts of anger, far beyond our concepts of emotion. So the consciousness is the same thing, as far as I understand. There are vibrations of energy that occur in many levels, 
There are emotional processes and intellectual processes that occur in those levels. But when you transcend and start entering into more superior levels of objective reasoning, this is a form of reasoning that has nothing to do with the intellect. And that subjective reasoning that we know, unfortunately, filters our understanding. Objective reasoning has qualities of consciousness which are reflected or mirrored in a very inferior way in what we call emotion and intellect. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, it's, uh... it's very subtle, right? Just, just understand that the consciousness itself is far beyond thought and feeling. And yet it has qualities that are similar, just more rarefied. It's, it's something that's hard to put in words. Do you have a question up here? Is yeah. The animal mind involved? Well, yes, of course. In us. In an animal, no, not necessarily. Because that mind develops through the kingdoms of nature. And once it, that mind enters a humanoid organism, there's a certain work that has to be performed, which is self perfection. Unfortunately, we, we develop karma. And so that mind, burdened by those elements, begins to degenerate. That's devolution. Yeah. Good question. Yes. It's possible to become identified with anything. Even in the state of emptiness, which is well beyond any intellectual, intellectual or emotional quality, you can become identified. This is how even very high masters fall. Sometimes it's because of love, superior emotion, something very beautiful, but it entrances the consciousness in a subtle way and they fall into mistake. So that danger is there, even at the highest level. Yes. And the same is true of a state of samadhi. You have to always watch for yourself to not indulge. Whether it's painful or pleasurable, to not indulge. Because that's a kind of identification. And immediately the ego arises. Whether it's a superior thing or an inferior thing. We have to maintain that equanimity. Tricky. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah,